so the top end of competitive 40k has had a few spanners thrown into the works. Games Workshop's balanced datasheet has really buffed and nerfed a whole bunch of armies, so let's have a talk about who's looking strongest now. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel, where today we're going to be doing a bit of an overview of the armies of 40k in general, talk about how the balanced data slate has changed things for quite a lot of them, and then give my own rough tier ranking, talk very quickly about every faction in the game, and roughly how well I think they're stacking up against the others right now. First we'll talk about the balanced data slate and how I think it's changed things, then go through each army in turn, starting with the lower tiers, then moving on towards the higher ones, and focus on how things have changed, and what makes the top tier armies top tier right now. Obviously this is slightly early days though, it's going to take time for the meta to adjust, and if you think I've ranked anything too high or too low, please as always let me know down in the comments, it's great to see your guys' discussion. So starting out, the top end of 40k had become a little bit stagnant I'd argue, Admic and Drakari firmly in the top tier, the armies to beat, and just having enormous amounts of power compared with lots of other factions. More recently they've started to get challenged a bit by armies such as Orcs and Grey Knights, Orcs in particular with their powerful flyers and freebooters Speedwar, and Grey Knights loving spamming loads of Dread Knights. There are plenty of other armies that could challenge them somewhat, Marines, Sisters, Death Guard and Demons all have at least some strong builds, but it was becoming a bit of a rarity to see any grand tournaments that weren't being won by one of the top four. Then Games Workshop actually decided to shake things up a bit, and I'm really glad that they did. Their balanced data slate handed out some fun rules buffs for Guard, Chaos Space Marines, Knights and Necrons, and through various means handed out some nerfs to Orcs, Admech and Drakari, though for Drakari some of their slightly lesser played units went down a touch too, so it wasn't all bad. As well as that, Black Templars got their full release, and we've had Warzone Octarius add its rules to the mix as well, with new rules like Speed Mob and Blood Axes for the Orcs, Codex Cadians for the Guard, and some really quite powerful buffs for Tyranids in their Codex Leviathan supplement and their Synaptic Link abilities. Overall it's buffs for a decent amount of armies across the field, and nerfs for some of the top ones, making 40k in general just a little bit more interesting again in my opinion. With that in mind I'm going to talk through the armies and where I'd rank their strength right now, starting with the ones I'd still consider weakest, and moving on to the stronger ones. So these are the ones that I'd currently argue are still some of the weakest factions in the game. Despite that though, I'd still argue they've been helped a little bit by some of the nerfs to the absolute top tier armies. First up we have the Imperial Guard, an army that I'd say will be at the top of this section, or could have maybe been included towards the bottom of the next. Guard have been really struggling throughout 9th in general, and for me despite having a bunch of extra options and buffs added, I just still have trouble ranking them much higher than they were before. From the balanced data slate, I'm just not really all that convinced that the orders buffs actually made much of a change at all, maybe just having the option to put around a few other lesser value orders on infantry formations. I'd say the more interesting things are the 2 plus armor save Rosses, which will definitely help and do give a decent buff to one of the guard's strongest units, and the Cadian supplement, which for me the most outstanding thing might have been their conscripts, allowing them to get reliable orders and also the potential for transhuman physiology if they need it. Maybe I was a little bit harsh on the guards to rank them down here, perhaps they should have been in the mid tier along with several of the others. I feel like guard lists are maybe going to lean a little bit more heavy on Rosses now, as well as combining the usual things like full payload manticores, and perhaps even mixing in some conscript blobs if you're playing Cadians. Next up we have Jean Stiller, Colt and Tau, who are kind of currently on hold at the moment, certainly more challenging to play with, though out of the two I'd say the Tau are perhaps stronger, with some interesting builds coming out of Farsight Enclaves in the hands of good players. They're both shortly to get codexes though, so it's not really too surprising that Games Workshop didn't give them any balanced data slate changes, they'd just be made redundant quite quickly. Perhaps the most surprising army not to get any changes were the Craftworld Eldar, again a faction that's really struggling, clearly on the lower end of the power spectrum, but didn't get any buffs whatsoever from the balanced data slate. I made an army overview video for Craftworld Eldar very recently, if you'd like to go and check that out, but particularly with some rumoured models on the way for them at some point in 2022. It might well be again that Games Workshop just haven't bothered to update the craft worlds, as they know that there's going to be a new book coming for them. Definitely still speculation at this point, but it seems very possible, seeing as they're one of the weaker armies in the game that could almost certainly have used an update. Moving on to the armies that are consider a bit more mid-tier now, these ones I think all still have some issues, but have at least some solid builds and playstyles that mean that they can compete against the top dogs. First up, I'm quite interested to see how Knight players are going to react to their balanced data slate changes, which were basically two massive buffs to taking and holding objectives. 
The Armagers count as five models and objectives, the Big Knights count as ten, and if every model in the army is a knight, then they get objectives secured as well. Winning the primary objective mission was perhaps one of the hardest things for a knight armies to do, seeing as it would only take a small amount of infantry to steal an objective away from them, even if you had a massive titanic super heavy walker on the objective, and the opponent only had say a few Gretchen or something. It hasn't changed their raw power at all, whether or not they're actually likely to win the fight overall, but it means that for any game that's at least somewhat close, I think it will usually mean that knights just get a few more victory points over the course of the game, which might well swing results. With some of the shootiest builds in Orcs and Admech getting toned down as well, it might also mean that they're a little bit less likely to just get gone straight off the board turn 1, which again can be somewhat of an issue if you've got a lot of titanic walkers that can't hide out of line of sight as easily. I'll be interested to see how people use that to translate things into top lists. For the Chaos Marines, their change was just largely to give them a flat combat buff in virtually every unit. Death to the False Emperor doesn't just affect Imperium units, it affects everyone now, and also it's got stronger as a rule in the first place, as now you don't just generate extra attacks from it, you generate extra hits straight off. It means that say if you had a Chaos Marine who was fighting against a non-Imperium army before, said Chaos Marine will now be on average 25% more deadly in combat than they were previously. That could be pretty nice in combination with things like Lightning Claw Terminators, or even things like Corn Berserkers or Abaddon. Abaddon in particular has got so much better with the Death to the False Emperor working on fives for him. Custodians again are generally unchanged, not a bad army, though maybe not quite a standout as some of the rest now, just due to codex creep. Again, they're going to be getting a new codex, so it kind of makes sense to reserve judgement until that comes out in January. Chaos Demons are kind of a mixed bag, they do have a couple of strong builds, including spamming loads of Slanesh Demons and Bellicor towards the enemy, or maybe doing some mixed Nurgle lists, things like Epidemius leading a whole bunch of Nurgle Demons and allied Plague Burst Crawlers and things. Even so, I think in general it's still going to be a bit harder to win with them compared with some of the top factions. And Harlequins, kind of similar to Custodes, very strong at the start of 9th edition, haven't really changed. But just Codex Creep and the balanced status late changes have now maybe left them as a bit more of a mid-tier army rather than one of the top ones. Moving on, here we have some of the stronger armies in the game right now. Though I have picked a couple that I think really stand out even above this. In general though, I feel like it's quite good that I felt the need to include quite so many armies on this list. I feel that in general, all of these can bring some really threatening builds, and in the hands of a good player, could be very very hard to beat indeed. Starting out, Admex suffered some massive nerfs in the balance data slate. Almost every single strong unit got slapped with something like a 10% points increase, so if you still want to run the same stuff that was strong before, you are just going to be running less of it. I feel like the balance data slate has done a decent job of making sure they're not just a level above virtually any other army, and now I think are going to be a little bit more of a challenging faction to play again. The cost of their units went up, they've also got limits on to how many planes they can run now as per the data slate, but I still think that they have an awesome amount of raw power that they can deploy. The stat lines on things like Skatari Rangers are still very impressive, and they still have one of the best codexes for giving them support, things like great character buffs, decent stratagems for damage increases, and enormously strong army-wide special rules such as Canticles and Doctrinas. I think perhaps Admet lists are going to have to have a bit of a rethink, and maybe there might be a bit more experimentation going on before the strongest builds emerge again as to what Admet can really achieve. The Death Guard certainly remains solid, really strong options including their Plague Burst Crawlers, Terminators, Pox Walkers, and decent support characters. They're still going to be a solid army to face, and can really punish armies that over-rely on damage to weapons. Thousand Sons generally haven't quite seen the same sort of success as the Grey Knights, but I think they're still really quite an interesting army to play right now. Mass Rubrics or Scarab Occult Terminators can be really solid on objectives. They should be able to put out a devastating amount of mortal wounds between Smite and their plus one to cast, and have plenty of crafty tricks that they can use to gain advantages, with their huge array of psychic powers they have on offer. The Orcs still remain very strong indeed, though I would argue that they've received some really big nerfs to perhaps their strongest build right now. Lists that were spamming Orc Planes and Buggies both have been hit hard by the change. At least now we won't be seeing entire armies of Rockatrock Squig Buggies just firing artillery into the enemy, or having 3 plus flyers fly over and use freebooters to hit everything on force with enormous alpha strike potential that's very difficult to counter. I feel they're still a very interesting faction to play though, and perhaps the changes have been good for making slightly more balanced looking Orc lists. I feel like we're going to see more War Bikers, more Kill Rigs and Beast Bosses on Squigasaurs, I still have a decent contingent of buggies in the one unit of rocket truck squig buggies and those mega track scrap jets that you can still field. Tyranids, I think, are perhaps one of the biggest winners recently. 
and I think between the awesome buffs that they got between Leviathan and Synaptic Link, they really are one of the strong contenders, and are going to be a nightmare to face for plenty of armies. Hopefully I'll be making a full video on Tyranids and Ninth in the near future, but in particular their Hive Garb can be ridiculously dangerous when they're layered with buffs, meaning the opponent kind of needs to come to you, something they might struggle to do when they have well-supported Gene Stealers or Termagant Bombs to deal plenty of damage to units that advance. It's really quite cool to see Tyranids being strong again, even if it does force them to over-rely on certain units, Hive Guard in particular. Next, the Sisters haven't really changed. I believe they're remaining at a similar kind of power level to the Death Guard, perhaps. Lots of strong options and interesting ways to build the army, though plenty of units are relatively fragile with their Toughness 3, and maybe a touch more challenging to command compared with some others. Not much to say here, though. They remain an interesting and strong army, and that's not really changed a lot. For Space Marines, I thought we'd just talk about them together in this video, seeing as again, like the sisters, not a fat lot has changed for them, and I didn't want the entire video just literally to be listing out chapters one by one. Obviously there are big power discrepancies between the chapters, you might find it easier to win with armies like Dark Angels, Iron Hands, White Scars or Death Watch, compared with armies like Imperial Fists or Raven Guards. Their builds will vary quite a bit, there's often good showing for things like their firepower dreadnoughts though, Melter from Eradicators or Attack Bikes, and their decent troops to hold down objectives, maybe setting up in the midfield if you're the Phobos troops. Finally, Necrons have been given a real shot in the arm from the balance data slate. Getting Core added to a whole bunch of their units opens up a lot more interesting combos for them. Previously, combos that were usually just used by units like big squads of warriors or Lich Guard. In particular, I think the Technomancer or Illuminor Seraz will be really interesting, when you can potentially be setting up models like Locust Heavy Destroyers or Score Pet Destroyers from the dead each turn, that's going to be a lot of points returned to the board, and it's opened up a wealth of options for things like the Scorpet Destroyers, Flayed Ones and Wraiths, better buffs from things like My Will Be Done, interesting stratagems like plus one strength for disruption fields, and a whole bunch of other good stuff. I have a feeling that we're going to be seeing a lot more Scorpet Destroyers and Flayed Ones and Necron lists soon. With access to buffs, the raw damage and durability that they can achieve is really quite impressive. Finally though, we get onto the top tier, and I've chosen to rank Grey Knights and Drakari, as perhaps some of the easier armies to win games of 40k with right now. Something is always likely to be the strongest, and I feel that these two might still be the factions to beat, but compared with when it was Admech and Drakari ruling the roost before their nerfs, both of these still feel to me that they're quite a lot more beatable than that, and perhaps a bit less oppressive. For the Grey Knights, they were certainly powerful before, and they were already putting in good tournament results against Admech and Drakari in their heyday, and I think it's kind of telling when they're one of the top four armies already, and then everything else receives some fairly hefty nerfs, they're going to stand out even more than before. I feel the real powerhouse of the Grey Knights are the Dread Knights right now. Taken in their stock build of having a sword, a psi cannon, and a silencer means they put out some devastating firepower before fighting in melee incredibly hard, and are still pretty tough to take out as well durability-wise with their 2-plus armor and 4-plus invul. It seems really quite common for people to be spamming at least four of these between one Grandmaster and three regular ones, and they feel like a solid core for the list to do the heavy lifting while all the other squads work around them. Maybe combine that with a few strike squads for some very efficient and scary objective defence, interceptors to jump round the table very quickly and bring some melee hurt to enemy infantry, maybe some servitors for actions, and some powerful characters such as Drago or Librarians to provide some extra buffs and damage. Having great psychic denial abilities is also quite helpful when you are fighting other psychers, and mortal wound protection is becoming more and more relevant in 40k, with lots of armies having the option to spam them out. Just all around it's a very solid army, and one that's going to be a difficult to beat for quite a lot of factions. Here's just one quick example of a Grey Knight's army list that's done well recently. I talked about them on the channel a little while back, and since then Grey Knights have taken a lot more tournaments. This one's by David McGeever, who came third with it at the Kent Wargames GT. And this one's essentially five Dread Knights with the loadout that I talked about, the Grandmasters stacked with a bunch of upgrades such as the Sigil of Exigence, and the Servant of the Throne for the 3 plus Invul. That's backed up by Caldor Drago himself, four strike squads with swords, and three units of Inceptors, some pretty high quality infantry to put the smack down on anyone who gets too close to them. Very intimidating to fight, you need to be killing these guys quickly, otherwise your army's just going to get rolled up. Moving back to the Drakari, I would say that they are weaker than previously. I think that their changes have turned them down a bit, as it basically nerfed most of the units that people were spamming in current competitive lists. Witches have been nerfed to the point where I don't think people are going to be taking them very much. The Succubus is still good, but does cost more. And there have been small nerfs to their other threats, such as Incubi, Archons, and their trusty Raiders. 
On the other hand, though, they didn't nerf everything, and they got some actually fairly surprisingly generous cuts on the Covenant side, I'd argue probably points cuts that they didn't really need to make. I think that people might have picked up a fair few of the Covenant things anyway, just because a lot of their undercosted stuff already got nerfed. Grotesques and Talos got some of the best buffs, they each went down significantly, and now for the points cost for their durability and damage, they're looking incredibly solid indeed. Both of those two combine really nicely with the minus one damage custom coven that you can get. So say for example, you've got a 35 point Grotesque, which is really quite decent in combat. He's got four toughness, five wounds, with a five plus feel no pain, and minus one damage, and at least some invul. It's the sort of combine profile that's just not going to go down without a significant amount of firepower. And they're still really fast with a movement of 7, and also being able to advance and charge from turn 2. It does seem that as a result, Drakari players have really embraced the Coven's lifestyle. I did talk about Richard Siegler's list a few days back from the Austin Open, but I feel like it's looking like a good representation of what people are likely to play with Drakari now. This list took literally no transports, I think that Raiders in general are going to be a bit more of a luxury pick, though maybe I'd say that we'll like to see just a few of them, as opposed to literally none. In any case, broadly speaking, there are three patrols. The one with the minus one damage has two units of Grotesques and two units of Talos, really big meaty units that are going to be hard to shift, and a great battle line. Plenty of the nice cheap and tough racks, one in really big units for holding down midfield objectives, and a homunculus to heal the units and also make them all plus one toughness. Then there's a Dark Technomancer's patrol, which really has great damage with the Kronos Parasite engines. They can put out some seriously nasty damage up close, another unit of racks, and an incredibly fighty succubus. Then finally a patrol led by an Archon with the Fight's Last Warlord trait and the Gin Blade that he can fight twice with, the very tough Court of the Archon with all of those wounds with Feel No Pains, and some more racks and Mandrakes. Overall it's just an enormously durable list, particularly if you manage to hide a fair amount of the army turn 1. It's still easily fast enough with most things moving 7 inches or more and getting advance and charge from turn 2. And the Talos, Kronos and Grotesques can all do some seriously heavy lifting damage-wise, as can some of the characters. Not hard to see why it did so well, particularly in the hands of an excellent general. Overall, I think the Drakari are perhaps going to be shifting more to Covens these days. I think they remain one of the top armies to beat, despite their nerfs, though it is interesting to see their playstyle shift quite so radically. So I think that just about brings us to the end of our talk. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. Is this fairly reflective of the state of 40k at the moment? Or do you think that I'm overvaluing or undervaluing any armies? Look forward to hearing what you have to say down in the comments. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics, where I'll certainly keep these videos coming regularly, and new content for 40k coming just about every single day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page, and you can find that down in the video description below. Making all the content does take a fair amount of time and effort, and if you are enjoying regularly, then any support is enormously appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, including seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some really big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, then the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.